I want to just take a moment to reflect on your patience as a jury. Uh, I, this case has is, is lasted almost three weeks. Uh, there's been decisions made by, by both counsel in order to organize the best we can in order to present this case. And, and we do recognize that that took a toll on your time, uh, your ability to, to go about your daily life, and, and that doesn't go unnoticed. So we do appreciate your patience as both parties have worked diligently to present this case. Um, and almost three weeks ago, we first entered this courtroom to begin the trial, and I stood right here at this podium. And I explained what the state believes the evidence is gonna show, and more importantly, I stressed about what this case is about. And I still think it's important to take a moment here and remind you of that. There's been a lot of testimony. You've seen a lot of evidence. You've seen a lot of video and reports. It can be easy to, to set things aside or fall for distractions, and I'm gonna ask you to not do that to really take each piece of evidence as it is and take your time with it. You're gonna be asked to decide whether or not the state met its burden, and that burden is beyond reasonable doubt. And further, you're gonna be asked to decide what I refer to as the core of this case when we started. And that core is whether or not Ms. Powell, at the time of the offense, was suffering from a serious mental disease and she wasn't able to know the wrongfulness of her actions. Now, Attorney Don Malarsic, in his opening statements that day, he came up here and he said that this case comes down to one question. It comes down to why. And I'm here to tell you that is not the question. The question is not why. You're going to get the law from the court, and I can tell you, you're not going to see the word why in there. Why did this happen? because that's not the law. The state has no burden to provide motive and insanity does not exist simply because there's no why. It might be hard to understand or hard to comprehend why, but that doesn't equal insanity. You're still left with the core question whether or not Miss Powell was suffering from the mental disease, which was severe, and whether or not she knew the wrongfulness of her actions. That's it. And ladies and gentlemen, when you look at all the evidence that's in front of you, step by step, the state believes that you're going to have your answer to those questions and that you're going to be able to find Ms. Powell guilty for what she did on March 3rd of 2020. So I, I know I, I thank you for your patience, but I'm going to ask you to be patient a little bit longer because I want to work through some things. And I want to talk about the law that you're going to be presented with. I want to talk about the state's evidence and what we believe it shows. And I also want to talk about what defense has presented, because as we mentioned before, this is a unique case where part of that burden shifts to them. And we're going to address that. And I first want to talk about, as I mentioned, the law. And I know when I first started, we talked a lot of this is answered for us. We know this took place in Ohio. We know it was Summit County. And we also know, because nobody's fighting this, that Ms. Powell committed these acts on March 3rd. Defense counsel, defense, they're not denying that. So a lot of this is there for you, but the state still holds a burden. We hold that burden proudly because it is a serious burden. We must, through our evidence, show that these charges and the elements in there are proven beyond reasonable doubt. And the first charge is the count of murder and that Ms. Powell did purposely cause the death of her mother, Brenda Powell. And you're going to present it, be presented with another charge of murder in count two. And I know that might be a little bit confusing. Why does the state have two charges of murder? Well, in the state of Ohio, murder can occur under different legal circumstances. And in this case, our position is that she did cause the death of her mother, Brenda, as a proximate result of committing or attempting to commit a violent felony, felonious assault. Now, what that means is... You may not believe that Miss Powell wanted to or meant to kill her mom. But the evidence still shows that she did cause harm, physical harm to her mom by the use of a frying pan and a knife. And because of those actions, Brenda passed away. That meets what we refer to as felony murder, the second theory of murder. So distinguish the two. The first theory is, or the first charge of murder is, she meant to kill her mom and she did so with purpose. 
The second is she meant to hit her mom or strike her mom with those, those weapons, and that action led to the death of her mother. You're also going to be presented with count three, and that we just talked about this, that she knowingly caused or attempted to cause physical harm. She knowingly hit her mom with that frying pan, proceeded to stab her with a knife. And those were the dangerous weapons she used in that. And lastly, you're going to be presented with count four, that she did alter with purpose to impair the value of that evidence. That Miss Powell, after the murder, after that murder was done, after Brenda was attacked, after she was hit, and after she died, that entire house became a crime scene. And Ms. Powell took the next step in breaking that back window, immediately altering any available evidence that would have been there for the investigation, tampering with evidence. Now, I'll stress it again, and I know it might be exhausting. The law is going to come from the court. This PowerPoint is, is kind of a guide, but the law is going to come from Judge McLaughlin. She'll provide it in your jury instructions, and I ask that you follow that. And these questions, these four charges, they've already been answered for you. Nobody's arguing that Ms. Powell didn't commit these crimes. The argument goes down to one issue, NGRI, not guilty by reason of insanity. And we just talked about it. At the time of the offense, that is important. Ms. Powell did not know, because of a severe mental disease, the wrongfulness of her actions. Now that burden, falls on the defense by a preponderance of the evidence. That's what they presented to you. Now, in order to reach your decisions on what the state has presented as its charges, and also NGRI, I'm gonna ask you to do the same thing I asked you a few weeks ago. Follow the evidence. But I'm gonna take it a step further, and I'm gonna agree with Attorney Malarsik that you should also follow the science, as he said, because it's the state's belief that by following the evidence, by following the science, it doesn't add up. Miss Powell was not suffering from a severe mental disease at the time of the murder, and she did know the wrongfulness of her actions. The evidence shows that, and the science supports it. And I want to talk about the defense's case. You got to hear from a few of their witnesses, family members, friends, teachers, and you got to hear from a series of doctors. And I want to break that down. Excuse me. First, we heard from Mrs. Betsy Brown. Mrs. Betsy Brown is Brenda's mother, and she's Sydney's grandmother. And there is absolutely zero doubt that Mrs. Brown loves and cares deeply for Miss Powell, for Sydney. From the very moment she learned of her daughter's murder, she was there to support her. She met her at the hospital. She helped post her bond. She took her in to live with her and her husband at the 100-acre farm that they own. She provided her housing, assistance, access to the animals. But when it comes to answering the ultimate question of this case, Mrs. Brown can't provide any evidence to that. That's not her fault. It's that the evidence we're asking you to look at stems to the moment of the murder, the moment of the crime. Mrs. Brown just gives us insight into Ms. Powell's current life, that she's going to her appointments, that she's taking medication, but no real insight into the evidence as to what Ms. Powell's mindset was at the time of the murder. And the same goes in a way with Ms. Amanda Brown a high school friend, a college classmate of Sydney, another person who openly admitted that she cares for Sydney. She cares to see what happens here. But she could never identify any moment where she had serious concerns that Miss Powell was having hallucinations, that Miss Powell was blacking out, that Miss Powell was talking to people and things that don't exist. Yeah, she reflected on a moment where a panic attack existed. And the state's not making light of that. At some point in her junior year of high school, Miss Powell had some concerns regarding a project, and she voiced those concerns. But Miss Amanda Brown testified that at no point did she think it was so concerning to report it to the Powells. At no point did she report it to the therapist or to a counselor or to the school nurse. 
It was anxiety around a high school project. You also heard from Mrs. Catherine Milligan. This is Sydney Powell's teacher through a few years in high school. Again, she's known Sydney for a long time. She cares for her. She recognized that she was a great student, and we're not denying that. The grades speak for themselves. Her friends and teachers speak for that. But Ms. Milli Mrs. Milligan, just as the other few witnesses to start, cannot provide any insight to the core of this question whether or not she was suffering from a severe mental illness. Because Mrs. Milligan cannot recall a single moment where was she concerned about these hallucinations, concerned about schizophrenia. She again brought up the incident where Ms. Powell suffered from an anxiety attack, a panic attack while in school. A memory that she herself couldn't remember, she had to be reminded of it by Dr. Reardon. And she told you that in that moment, where Ms. Powell described to her as sudden blindness, she didn't find it serious enough to report it to anyone. Not the school, not the therapist, not the family. In that moment, Ms. Powell left her chemistry classroom instead of going to that chemistry teacher. She sought out her favorite teacher, explained what was going on, and through Mrs. Milligan, she was able to get out of that project at that moment. That's all Mrs. Milligan can provide us. And I'm not saying ignore it. I'm saying listen to every one of these witnesses because they do provide us some insight. And we'll talk about that. Now we also, as you know, you heard from a array of doctors. Doctors who were sought out by defense, psychologists who provided their opinion on this case. And I want to remind you that you're going to have these records. You're going to have every record from every doctor who testified there, as well as some of the medical records that they reviewed. And I'm going to ask you right now to spend your time with them, to read them, to review them, to note them, to really focus on these reports, because we hope that in doing that, you're going to recognize some issues. Evidence that's ignored or never addressed, conclusions made by each and every one of them without supporting outside evidence other than Ms. Powell, the defendant's own statements. Look for this information, it's there, and we're gonna talk about it. Each of these doctors, Dr. Reardon, Dr. Swales, Dr. Timmy, they met with Ms. Powell at different times. Some earlier on, some later on, the reports vary in time frames, years or three years after. And each of them reached conclusions. And the main conclusion that they find is that Ms. Powell suffered from schizophrenia. And they each find the conclusion that she's not guilty by reason of insanity. But there's also a series of other conclusions made by each of them that don't make sense. They themselves compete with each other. They contradict each other. One of the only things these doctors shared was their ability and decision to ignore certain evidence that would have given them insight to major moments in Ms. Powell's events on March 3rd and the weeks leading up to. They had access to insight to see what she was doing before, doing during, and doing, af and doing after. And each of them failed to answer these questions. Now, I don't mean to minimize their reports because these doctors are, are well-trained, they're well-educated, they're all experts in this field. But I just, in, in a brief summary of what, kind of the core of what they came up was. Dr. Reardon, that this was a full-blown psychotic break. Dr. Swales, that throughout time, Ms. Powell was building these systems, this onset of system was coming towards her and finally manifested on the third. And Dr. Robert Belcher Timmy, I'll refer to him as Dr. Timmy, flashes of reality. Each of these compete with each other because they want you to believe different stories, different theories that will ultimately reach their main conclusion. And I wanna talk about each of these doctors. First, we're gonna look at Dr. Reardon. This is the first doctor you heard from. He provided, I'm not gonna go over everything he looked at, but I am gonna take some time to review some of the things he, he used in order to make his determinations. He speaks with a high school teacher and a high school friend. And just like attorney Malarsic approached Dr. Obradovich, he didn't reach out and call Lauren Curry. 
He didn't reach out and call any of the friends she was with, any of her other roommates during that time. None of them did. He reaches out to somebody who hasn't seen her in years. Can't even remember an event from six years ago. He also reviews the evaluation. There's two evaluations. He reviews the first one from Dr. Swales. And in his own report, he's very open about this, Dr. Reardon disagrees with Dr. Swales. Because there's moments where Dr. Swales relies on the initial test at the hospital when Sydney's first brought in. Dr. Swales acknowledges that there's concerns of malingering, feigning symptoms, excessive number of infrequent responses. Dr. Reardon, he completely disagrees. His conclusion is, well, it also could have been acute psychosis. And I'll just take it for that. <clears throat> Dr. Reardon reviews the medical examiner's report. And you're going to see this language that he uses. He refers to the medical examination, the photos and the crime scene photos he sees as a frenzied attack. Uncontrolled violence, somebody who is nearly berserk. Now, I'm not going to pretend that those photos were easy to look at. It's a difficult crime scene. There's extreme violence there. We're, we know that. You've seen that. But in almost every murder, there's violence. Somebody has lost their life with the use of violence. And he says that it's frenzied. But I want you to look at the evidence. I want you to hear from the detectives that testified, the crime scene photos. It wasn't frenzied. Those are isolated attacks to Miss Brenda Powell's face, head, skull. The stab wounds were isolated to her throat only. This was not frenzy across her body. There was a purpose in this attack. And he says that whoever did this was in a near berserk state of mind, but completely ignores that during this berserk state of mind, Miss Powell twice turns to the phone and holds conversations with others. That during this berserk moment, she's able to stage a crime scene. And Dr. Reardon, he also reviews her medical records. The initial ones from SUMA, from Akron Children's Cleveland Clinic. But what he doesn't acknowledge is that in those initial reports, there are concerns from some of these doctors that there might be some malingering symptoms. There might be some feigning symptoms or things that don't add up. To use patience in order to figure this out. To look at this with caution for malingering. To not rule out malingering until it can be tested. He doesn't acknowledge those. He says, yeah, those exist, but it could also mean acute psychosis. And I think it's important, I don't mean to sidetrack here, but we learned a lot of this from Dr. Obradovich that at the moment on March 3rd, March 4th, March 5th, when Ms. Powell was brought into the hospital, she is a patient first. That is those doctors' priority, to look after her medically. At the time she comes in, they don't know what happened on Scudder Drive. They don't know that she's a possible suspect. They think she's a victim. They don't know that she's made statements to police. They don't know about the school. They don't know about the phone calls. All they're going off of is Miss Powell's inability to answer their questions. That's all they have. And at that time, treating her as a patient first, they were concerned that she couldn't answer questions and she was acting catatonic. That was their priority in providing her care. But in doing so, they also recognized some concerns that She's still able to react to some questions. She's still able to recognize certain situations. But Dr. Reardon just sets that aside. It's still acute psychosis, even though there was concerns. Now, he reaches a series of conclusions here. And I talked to you about a, a psychotic break. Dr. Reardon says that during the week of February 24th through 3-3, Ms. Powell was completely delusional in a full-blown psychotic break. But he doesn't provide any evidence to support that. He tells you that there's a delusion that Miss Powell still thinks she's enrolled at Mount Union. But if she's still enrolled at Mount Union and believes she's a student, why does she not go to class? Why is she not emailing professors for homework? Why is she not contacting 
her RA, hey, my name's not on my dorm. Because there is no delusion. Miss Powell knows she's not a student there. And she's just not ready to face that truth and tell those around her. She's not ready to disappoint them. She doesn't have control over it. She's trying to buy herself time. Dr. Reardon talks about isolation, that Miss Powell is starting to withdraw from her friends, from her school. But the only way to see that is to try to figure out what was going on during that week for Miss Powell and the months subsequent. And Miss Powell, she can't remember that, she states. So what other resource could he look at? The cell phone, as Dr. Obradovich did? But he doesn't. He doesn't open up the cell phone, he doesn't read the data, he doesn't read the text message or the activity. He just says that she's isolating with no supporting facts as her, to do, her doing so. And yeah, there's no doubt that Miss Curry went in there and Miss Brown came in here and they testified that, yeah, Sydney was a little bit withdrawn. She seemed like something was bothering her. We're not denying that. Something very heavy is bothering Miss Powell. She's kicked out of Mount Union and she doesn't know how to tell anyone. She's not ready to tell anyone. Those stressors are real. And yeah, maybe she doesn't want to go to the sorority meetings because her dues are owed. She's going to be questioned by the sorority sisters. Hey, Sydney, you're not a student here. You're not on our roster. She's not isolating because of a schizophrenic psychotic break. She's isolating because she's trying to buy time. Dr. Reardon goes further and he says that, yeah, we recognize normal behavior through Miss Powell, the bachelor party the booking of hotels, the communicating with friends, but the whole time she's actually decompensating. But there's no evidence of decompensating because all we can see is through the text message through Ms. Powell's own actions is that she's still participating in everyday life. She's still communicating with mom and dad. She's still addressing her issues with the university. She's still telling Lauren, getting up with Lauren every morning to go to class. Where's the decompensation? He can't point to anything. You got to see a, a portion of the body worn camera, 90 seconds of edited clips that Dr. Reardon watched with us. I mean, there's hours and hours and hours of clips from this incident, of body worn camera footage, I should say. So we saw a brief 90 seconds with Dr. Reardon. And in that 90 seconds, the edited clips, catatonic, catatonia, absolutely. And there's no doubt, we saw the same clips that you did, that Miss Powell has completely shut down. But what Dr. Reardon fails to acknowledge is the moments before she tips over, the moments before she stops talking. Because when police arrive, she's immediately able to communicate with them. Is my mom okay? Is she going to be okay? There was a break-in. We heard a bang. She's immediately telling her story. And when Officer Jackson gets to her, are you hurt? No. Okay, well, let's go outside. I want my dad. I want my dad. And when Mr. Powell shows up, dad, there was a break-in. There was a break-in. We heard a bang. She's communicating. She even tells Officer Jackson when he tries to sit her down, well, you told me to sit on the ground. She's listening. She's responding. And finally, at some point, the shock catches up to her. She has just gone through something brutally horrific, the murder of her mom at her own hands. It catches up. She shuts down. But that catatonia does not automatically mean that she didn't know the wrongfulness of her actions that day. And Dr. Reardon, he does a, philosoph or sorry, a, a psychological autopsy. That's what he referred it to as, and it's something we've heard before. And this is where he comes up with the whole theory that she's in a full psychotic break the week of February 24th to February 23rd. Yet everyone in her life doesn't recognize it. Nobody notices it in her text messages, in her sharing of memes, in her communication with friends, in her hangout with friends. The day of the murder, just over an hour before she take her mom's life, in what Dr. Reardon says is a full psychotic break, she's able to communicate with her dad, Mr. Stephen Powell. So much that he returns to work, later telling police that she was 100% fine. 
But Dr. Reardon wants you to believe that that was in the midst of a full-blown, berserk, psychotic break. No one else noticed. And Dr. Reardon, just as every other doctor, was presented with the ultimate question. And they gave their answer of NGRI. But they were also confronted, well, first let me say this, because Dr. Reardon himself, he wasn't confronted until Prosecutor Stano stood up here and asked him, well, what do you make of Miss Powell's actions during the murder? Dr. Reardon keeps saying, my focus was on the three and a half minutes, the three and a half minutes of the murder. But when confronted by that, well, during that three and a half minutes, she answers the phone twice. How does that make sense if she's in a full-blown psychotic break? And right here in front of you, right at this witness stand, Dr. Reardon, without evidence, without support, without anything, gave you two brand new theories. Well, maybe she thought she was her mom. Well, maybe she thought she was killing herself. That's not in his report. That's not anywhere. He came up with that because there was no answer for this, the actions of Ms. Powell during this time. And when you read Dr. Reardon's report, not once, not a single mention of her actions during the murder, of the staging of the crime scene, of the calls to dad, of the calls to Mount Union, of lying to the police. He completely ignores it. Full-blown psychotic break. But no one noticed. Dr. Swales, he meets with Ms. Powell two times. 2021, again in 2023. And he recognizes that throughout her life, there's an onset of symptoms that were missed by family members. And I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to say that the symptoms are clear as day and everybody should know if their child's suffering through something like this. That's not what I'm here to address this as. But what he says is that these onsetting symptoms, he learns of them through one person and one person only, Miss Powell. Every symptom since she was a child is reported by Miss Powell. And there's zero cooperation, there's zero support, other than anxiety, panic attack, and depression, and we'll talk about that. But there's no evidence outside of Miss Powell's statements that there's ever been hallucinations. And she states in herself that, that these hallucinations started when she was 11 or 12, which from the science, even the own doctor said, yeah, it's possible, but that itself is rare that this must be an alarm, uh, this must be a rare occasion. And, and Dr. Swales, he's able to come up with, with a series, and you'll see, this in his, see these in his report, a series of conclusions of what she was going through, what her symptoms were, false beliefs that people were talking about her, that the FBI was listening to her phone. She reports auditory and visual, visual hallucinations. She heard people say, Sydney, you're no good. She saw, he, he told you, he sat there and he said, she told me that she saw flames coming from her hands. Isn't that insane? That was his quote. He says that she told him she had disorganized thoughts, that she couldn't keep her mind straight. She tells him that she would speak nonsense to her friends, and her friends were always like, Sydney, why are you acting so strange? All of this, all of these symptoms, they come from Miss Powell over a year later. They don't come from friends. They don't come from family. They're not supported by anyone in her life. It's Miss Powell's reporting. And Dr. Swale, just as I said, he's also confronted with the question that you have to answer. Was she suffering from a mental disease and whether or not she knew the wrongfulness of her actions? And he sat there and he just said to Don Millar, to attorney Malarsic, she was out of her mind. That's all he said. He didn't expand on it. He didn't give reason. He just said, she's out of her mind. And he also addressed this, this moment that Ms. Powell suffered from disassociative amnesia, but ignores the fact that she was still able to answer the phone during all this, to pretending to being Brenda, to returning her call to Mr. Powell and saying, yeah, mom's fine. She's talking to Mount Union that during this amnesia, she's able to break the window and stage a crime scene. But he wants you to believe that during all this, she's out of her mind. 
And I think it's important to note that the amnesia he talks about, the disassociation, that's not entirely true because we get a little snapshot if you look at all the medical records of all the different recordings that Ms. Powell has told. Let's look at the first one. The police arrive, she immediately tells them there's been a break-in. And that story continues all the way into the hospital. Even when she's catatonic, she's still mumbling, get out of the house, get out of the house, supporting her original plan that there was a break-in. And when she's charged with that crime, she now starts to state that she cannot remember. She remembers going to the basement because the voices were too loud. And when she woke up, the knife was in her mom's chest and she was trying to stop the bleeding. Well, that's not the last story because then she tells Dr. Swales years later that no, I actually blacked out when I went in the basement and I don't remember anything until I woke up in the hospital. It's not disassociated amnesia, she's selecting Again, her own reporting. What best fits the situation to protect myself? And you heard lastly from Dr. Timmy, who met with Sidney Powell in December of 2022, again in January of this year, 2023. And just like Dr. Reardon, Dr. Timmy wants you to believe two things. That Ms. Powell was suffering from a delusion while she was at Mount Union the delusion that was she was still a student. But if she, again, I say this, if she thinks she's still a student, she's not going to classes. She's not responding to emails. She's not accessing her class schedule. But he also goes further and say that during this time, her symptoms became so severe that she was so depressed she couldn't leave the room. Well, we know that's not true because she did leave the room. But it also begs the question, if she thinks she's a student, then why would she be depressed of getting kicked out? She can't have the delusion and the depression. Because if she has the depression, then she knows she's been kicked out. He wants to give you both options. And that's what he did here. And Dr. Timmy, he refers to flashes of reality. That during this time period, Ms. Powell was having flashes into reality and flashes outside of her reality. And he supports that with, unfortunately, no evidence. Because we get a snapshot into what Ms. Powell's doing during these weeks. She's keeping up her lie. She decides that at times she needs to stay at a hotel because she can't go home until the 4th. She supports all of her lies. She continues these. She backs them up to make sure they last. But he says, well, outside of that moment, she's actually flashing out of reality. But gives not a single evidentiary line or moment where she's flashing out of reality. He just says it's happening when we don't see it. And I, I, I don't want to sidetrack here, but I think it's important to take a moment and remind us where evidence comes from. And that's that witness box. Because there were a lot of questions that, okay, well, we know Ms. Powell stayed in the hotel for a certain time. Well, where was she the other day? Well, she must have been sleeping in her car. I want to remind you, there is no evidence of that. Nobody knows that. Nobody can account for that. It's never been reported where she was sleeping. So no matter how many times it was asked, maybe she was sleeping in her car? Yeah, maybe. But it's important to remember where the evidence comes from. That's that witness box. Not this podium where I'm standing. Not for me. Not for Prosecutor Stano. Not from Attorney Malarczyk at that podium. Each of the doctors, I'll get back to that because I want to finish with Dr. Timmy here. Um, because one of the things that stood out in his report, again, I want you to read it. I want you to take your time with it. Is in this report, he comes at Dr. Obradovich. And that's part of his job. I mean, we're not passing any judgment. But he says, Dr. Obradovich fails to provide an alternative theory as to why Ms. Powell did this. And I want to remind you that is not the law. Providing theories as to why is not the measurement for insanity. We may not always know why something happens, but that does not equal NGRI. The question remains within the law whether or not she was suffering from a men severe mental disease and whether or not she knew the wrongfulness of her actions. And that same question is presented to Dr. Timmy. Dr. Timmy, did she know the wrongfulness? No, she didn't. Well, Dr. Timmy, how do you explain then 
that she was able to lie to her dad, lie to Mount Union, stage a crime scene, lie to the police. Well, he says those are moments where she flashes back into reality. But I want you to compare that to Dr. Obradovich. How does somebody who is in what they call a full psychotic break able to immediately snap back into reality upon a phone call and immediately come up with a story that there was a break in? Because she's not snapping in and out of reality. Her reality is there in front of her, that she's taking her mother's life and she needs to get out of it. She doesn't have time to create another lie, so she thinks on her feet impulsively. This isn't a flash in and out reality. That doesn't make sense. How can she flash out of it and then immediately come back and decide, well, I need to break a window right now? And there was a lot of questions about staging a crime scene, and I want to address that. We know that there's a time frame that this murder takes place, 27 minutes, I believe, before the police arrive and the phone calls that happen. And I think it's important to remember what Mount Union uh, Mr. Frazier and Ms. Gaffney told us that they called the Akron Police Chief's Department and they reported that they were concerned that something happened on Scudder Drive. At this time, nobody but Mount Union, Ms. Powell, and the Akron Police Department know what's going on or what might be going on. But for Detective Dietz calling Mr. Powell, Ms. Powell never would have known the police were coming because she learned that from her dad. Dad gets a call from his friend, Detective Dietz. Hey, something's going on. And being a good dad, he takes that step and he calls home. What is going on? And I'm not knocking Detective Dietz. He's being a good friend. There's some concerns. And that's the first time that Miss Powell ever realizes the police are on their way. That's when she comes out with the first lie. Because before that, seconds before it, she tells dad, no, mom's fine. She's on the phone. Well, Cindy, the police are coming. There's the lie. I have to protect myself. Dad, there was a break in. She's now hysterical. So we don't know what Miss Powell would have done, but for learning that the police were coming. A lot of the doctors were asked, well, if she was staging a crime scene, why wouldn't she clean the blood off of herself? That doesn't make sense. Yeah, it does. If you're staging a crime scene that there was a break in, why would you clean the blood off? Your theory is that you were helping your mom. Of course you're covered in blood. To wash off the blood wouldn't make sense if there was a break in. Each of these doctors, they're asking you to believe an array of conclusions. And these conclusions, they compete with themselves. They want you to believe these conclusions, but they refuse to give you any real supporting evidence outside of Ms. Powell's own statements in order to believe that she suffered from schizophrenia. And in order for them to believe that, they had to first believe Ms. Powell, the reporting symptoms that she gave them. They ignored the scientific evidence that points to the early concerns of malingering. Yes, I want to pause here. I am not knocking these doctors. They are professionals. They are dedicated to their practice. They did the psychological tests that were needed at the time. They met with Ms. Powell. Nobody had access to perform these tests early on when the murder first happened, as Dr. Obradovich stated would have been best. And I'm not here to question those results of those tests, because those doctors followed the procedure. But those tests can only give insight into Ms. Powell's malingering or fainting of symptoms years down the road. None of them can answer what was happening on March 3rd of 2020. There, they're stuck with only Miss Powell's responses. And when presented with the fear or the fact that there might be some malingering concerns early on on March 5th, March 6th, March 7th, they just say, well, yeah, it also could be acute psychosis. Yeah, but it also could be this. And they're asking you to do the same. And I'm going to remind you again, listen to the evidence, listen to the science. Their conclusions don't line up. But what does line up is, is this timeline, this access that you have to the evidence. And I'm not going to rehash everything. I've been talking a while. But we know that Ms. Powell's kicked out of Mount Union. 
And we know that the Powell's, Mr. and Mrs. Powell, start to have some concerns around this time. Because we know that Mr. Powell at some point tries to pay his tuition and is unable to. When he confronts Miss Sidney Powell about it, she says, oh, there's just an issue, I'll get it fixed. Another lie to buy herself time. And we see in the text message that Miss Brenda Powell is starting to have some concerns. Sydney, why do I feel that you're always scamming us? Sydney's able to get herself out of that situation. And then later she says, Sydney, what's this lie you're telling dad about you working at the library? If you are working in the library, we don't have to give you any more money. Well, Miss Powell says, no, 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 don't go that far. She's not working at the library. She's going to the library during the day because she has to pretend she's going to class. And Mr. Powell on the Life 360 starts to wonder, why is Sydney always at the library? Her response, another lie to buy herself time. Dad, I got a job there. But Brenda knows that's not true. What's this lie you're telling your dad about? The lie that she's built is starting to crumble. She needs to buy herself time and she doesn't have those options. And we know that on 3-3, Miss Powell goes home and she's first confronted by Mr. Stephen Powell. He leaves his phone at work so he can get to her without her noticing. She's pulled in the garage, he confronts her at home, and this is the first time she voices her concern about school, but does not disclose to dad that she's been kicked out. She's still hiding that lie. And dad, in what the doctor says is a complete psychotic break, recognizes that Sydney is 100% fine. He returns to work, turning to his wife, Brenda, to get this situation figured out. Again, she's confronted by Brenda Powell. And we don't know what that conversation was. And we know from Ms. Powell's early statements that mom gave her a hug and told her, I love you. But we also don't know because Sydney says she doesn't remember anything but the basement. We know that Brenda at some point calls Mount Union and that phone call is interrupted by a thud. Another thud, another thud, another thud and screams from what Mount Union believes was Miss Sydney Powell. Miss Sydney Powell would continue to hit her mom with a cast iron skillet, a frying pan, and then she would proceed to stab her mom in the throat with a kitchen knife. During this attack, Ms. Powell was interrupted by the phone call again. We've talked about it. She answers the phone to Mount Union pretending to be her mother. This is Brenda. When confronted that that's a lie, she hangs up the phone. She's trying to buy herself time. But the phone doesn't stop ringing because now Mr. Powell has learned that something might be going on and the police are on their way, so he keeps calling. Ms. Powell, trying to buy herself time, calls dad back, yeah, everything's fine. No, it's not. Sydney, the police are on their way. And now we have to build another lie to protect ourselves. That's what Miss Powell's doing. And that's where she stages the crime scene and she's interrupted by the police arriving very quickly. By the time she talks to dad and breaks the window and gets things organized, time's flying and the police are there. And now she has to buy herself time by screaming, there's been a break in, we heard a bang. Anything she can do to keep herself safe to continue the lie and you get insight into all of this you have the body worn camera you have her statements you have the report look at all of it you can see the conscious decisions that sydney's making the week before the weeks before the day of all to ensure that the lie exists and she can buy herself time but when that phone call was answered by brenda the time had run out she had no other options but to try to stop it and that's what she did. And that resulted in Brenda Powell losing her life. You've heard a lot from me. You've heard a lot from the state, Prosecutor Stano, Attorney Don Malarstic, and all of our witnesses. We've talked about the facts over and over. You've heard the story. It can get exhausting, I'm sure. But I want to take a moment and address somebody who we haven't been able to talk about that much, and that is Miss Brenda Powell. There's no doubt we've heard from her family. She was an absolutely dedicated mother, a dedicated child life specialist. She loved her family. She loved everything she was involved in. There's no denying that. And she was loved by everybody, her family especially. But Brenda Powell on March 3rd did lose her life. 
in an extremely violent and brutal way. She lost the chance to grow old with her husband, Stephen. She lost the chance to watch Andrew graduate and build his life. She lost the chance to see what Miss Powell had available to her. She lost the chance to continue her bonds with her mother, with her family. She lost her life because of the impulsive decisions in order to protect herself that Miss Powell made. This lie was so heavy and so big, she just needed more time, and that's the action she took. Unfortunately, that action interrupted any of Miss Brenda Powell's future. I mentioned when I first came in this courtroom that this case is not, I don't even want to say that. This case is, is difficult. We're not going to hide that. It pulls on the emotions and the connections that each of us make as humans. It draws on our own experiences with struggles with mental health and, and relationships and those in our family. And I want to remind you that the state is aware of mental health. We acknowledge that. We acknowledge that even in Ms. Powell, anxieties and depressions and concerns have existed. That this lie was a heavy burden. But I need to remind you that mental health is not insanity. The law controls that. And to say otherwise is insensitive to mental health. It's insensitive to those who struggle with schizophrenia. The law is specific when it addresses sanity, severe mental disease, and the inability to know the wrongfulness. It's okay for you to recognize someone's anxiety, someone's mental health issues, even Ms. Powell's. I'm going to ask you to do that. It's okay to recognize the struggles in school and the fear of letting those down as, as heavy. But to relate these struggles to that of insanity, that does not line up and it shouldn't line up. You must use the evidence that's available to you, available to you to understand what her mindset was at the time of the crime. Not well before, not well after three years now, at the time of the crime. And there's a bridge here. And in order to enter this bridge, you're first gonna have to ask whether or not Miss Powell suffered from serious mental illness. That bridge starts over here. And it's the state's position through the evidence through Dr. Obradovich, through Ms. Powell's own statements and actions, she does not suffer from schizophrenia. In order for you to believe that, you have to believe the testimony of Dr. Reardon, Dr. Swales, and Dr. Timmy. But remember the limitations in their testimony, that their evaluations focus on the current status of Ms. Powell, and they struggle to address the concerns during the murder. But let's say you meet that first problem. We'll acknowledge that. Let's say in this hypothetical, you agree that Ms. Powell suffers, suffers from schizophrenia. Okay, you've entered the bridge. Well, now you need to cross the bridge. And in order to do that, you need to decide whether or not she was suffering from that severe mental disease at the time of the crime. We talked with Dr. Obradovich and each of those doctors. Many of the individuals who suffer from this mental disease are not violent. Many individuals who suffer from schizophrenia do not act out in this way. Just because you're schizophrenic does not mean you're insane for the purposes of the law. They're not hand in hand. There's a distinction there. But if you still believe that she was suffering from schizophrenic at the time of the crime, then you can walk to the other side of the bridge. And there you're confronted with whether or not she knew the wrongfulness of her actions. And there the evidence speaks for herself because the very moment before the murder, during the murder, after the murder, all of her actions say how much she knew that these were wrong. She knew that what she was doing was wrong and at all costs, she tried to hide it. She was in control of her mind that day. She made these decisions to protect herself at all costs, to keep her lie from ever seeing light. And in that moment, the lie was coming true. Everyone was about to know and she had no other options. So ladies and gentlemen, these lies, they've come to light in this courtroom. They're presented to you through testimony, through evidence. On March 3rd of 2020, Miss Powell murdered her mother, Brenda. And if you follow the science, you follow the evidence, we believe that you will come to the decision that Miss Powell is guilty of that crime and that she was not suffering from a severe mental disease that prevented her from knowing that wrongfulness. Thank you.